co-host, but I guess that confused the system. But welcome to a panel, um, a ADAPT pre-conference panel of instructors at UNCG teaching online. Um, and we also are lucky to have some instructional technology consultants here on the panel. So all of the panelists have um, years of experience working with online courses at UNCG. Um, even before the um, pandemic. So that is what we're here to kind of talk about today. And we do have a set of questions. We are recording in the cloud. Um, I am moderating as the chair of the Online Learning Faculty Senate Committee. Um, but if you have any questions, comments, um, be free, free, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and the, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the panelists who are all co-hosts. Um, just quickly introduce yourself and say um, what department you're with, um, if you can remember how many years you've been teaching online, um, and then we'll get going with the questions. So we'll start with Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Moorfield Lang. I'm an associate professor with the School of Education, specifically in the Department of Library and Information Science. Um, I have been teaching online full time uh, for eight years, part time, I don't even begin to know. Um, and I used to teach at the University of South Carolina and I was fully asynchronous in that program. Uh, here at the University at UNC Greensboro, I am fully synchronous. Um, and so, yeah, that's about it. Great. Pam. Hi, I'm Pam Brown. I'm in the Department of Kinesiology. I'm faculty there and also the director of the um, Doctor of Education in Kinesiology, which is our online program that is in its ninth year. So super exciting there as far as teaching overall. Um, online since 2002 and like Heather, um, I don't, well, actually, I don't even know when I started full time other than at, for sure last, at least the last 10 years. So. Mostly asynchronous. Rob. Hello, everyone. My name is Rob Owens. I am an instructional technology consultant with the Bryan School of Business and Economics. I've been working at UNCG since 1998. I have my doctorate in kinesiology. Pam was one of my mentors. And I've been working with faculty um, who have taught online since, I guess, since like 2000 with the Nita Warford. Uh, so glad to have, glad to be here and be part of this panel. Thanks. Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine Aldridge. I'm with Human Development and Family Studies um, in HHS, as is Pam and some others probably. Um, I'm the director of an undergraduate online degree completion program there. And I have been teaching full-time online for uh, 13 years. And I had my bacon saved frequently by Rob and Anita at the beginning of the process. <laughs> um, and I've taught in just about every modality, which I will discuss later in the panel. Thank you. Anita. Hi, Anita Warford, Instructional Technology Consultant for the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, so like Rob said, I've been working with faculty on online course development for about 22 years. Um, as for myself, as early as the late 90s, I taught some history courses that I kind of unofficially enhanced on my own. They were face-to-face -face courses that I knew how to do, um, you know, websites and things like that. So I enhanced the courses on my own to help the students out. Um, and then more recently, I've uh, been teaching a fully online asynchronous course in the BLS uh, program. Wade. Hello. So I'm trying to do the math in my head. Uh, 22 years, 2000. Uh, but unlike a lot of folks here, there was no support. It was sort of the Wild West, do it on your own, figuring it out as you go. Um, but I've been doing this as at least half of my load since that time and really been uh, my full load the last uh, five to six years as I have uh, my background is philosophy, but I'm also the director of the Bachelor of Liberal Studies program, which is our oldest online program where I've been jointly appointed since about 2005. Uh, so I've been doing this a long time and I've seen a lot of things change and uh, they're gonna continue to change. So look forward to seeing what those of you who watch this just will be telling us in five to 10 years about how everything we said was wrong. 
Yes, well, that is a great segue into our first question. So as you all know, this is a pre-conference for ADAPT 2022. Um, and ADAPT 2022 is about teaching during transformative times. Since the pandemic and changes at UNCG, MAC, new, the MAC, such as MAC, the new general education curriculum, budget cuts, and more, teaching online is changing. How has online teaching changed for you at UNCG during these times? And I'm putting this in the chat as well so we can know what question we're on. Um, so um, whoever wants to talk first, and just to be clear too, um, you don't have to answer every question, panelists, um, and also people in the audience, feel free to participate in chat. Um, or unmute to ask questions during it as well. This is a kind of loose flowing panel. Well, I'll start, I don't mind. <laughs> so, um, I think one of the biggest things that has changed has been flexibility. So I've always been a fairly flexible instructor when dealing with students, but I would say, especially since the pandemic, we've all had to become even more flexible because of all the different challenges our students have been facing, in some cases we've been facing. Um, so uh, I think flexibility would be the main point that I would say. Um, and you know, in addition to that, I think a lot of us um, in this situation are uh, more specific to recent changes, changes involving um, the budget and how instructors can or can't be paid. Um, I actually don't know if I'll be teaching my course again. So I think, um, that's something that we as instructors in particular are facing. Um, so that's, that's what I have. I'll follow in on that. Um, I'm a big fan of breaking stuff because we don't break enough stuff. We're still in many ways an 18th century institution. That's why everyone goes home over the summer to harvest crops, right? Um, but we in the online space have learned that flexibility that Anita, Anita talks about is because the students' lives have changed. And we have to look at who our students are and the, the amount of working adults, the parents, et cetera. They're not just 18 in a dorm having all day to just take classes. And so the more you design courses that are not on a 15 week semester, so many of our programs, we look at seven week courses, which can be offered by any department, for example. We look at designs that don't have a weekly due date, that don't have short windows, but have very long windows, flexible scheduling, um, something nearer to, but maybe not entirely at your own pace because that fits the lifestyle needs of our students. Those trends are pre-pandemic, but the pandemic has certainly exacerbated them. Um, so mostly our student needs have changed these last couple of years. So need is dead on, so thank you. I'll, you know, agree totally with Anita and Wade and just had written down flexible, you know, as one of my own notes, but also just uh, with the pandemic, you know, again, our program is an online program. Our students have been doing this for years, but they still were affected by the pandemic. Um, you know, I think there's a lot less separation between life, work, school, whatever it may be. So everything sort of collapsed and really, again, figuring out how to help people to, um, you know, just manage their time and make it worthwhile to, to spend the time and effort in school. So, so really thinking also about what you're asking students to do and why they're doing it and even helping them to see that even more. So there's really that understanding of, um, you know, again, why to invest that time? Because again, for our students, a lot of them would do work in the evening or while their kids were at school or at a break of time in their own lunch or you know something like that but now all of those things just happen <laughs> so again just just really helping students and and um, you know maybe this like wade was saying you know figuring out what we really need to do like how can this be flexible are we tend to have weekly due dates or assignment dates. Um, so we have not taken that piece out, but again, trying to help students perhaps with that pacing or looking ahead, or again, making sure that all the things they're doing have some relevance to them. And that doesn't mean having to ch always change the content, but again, helping people to be thoughtful about what will this do for me in the moment and how will this support me going forward? Okay, does anyone else have anything to add? Those were all great. Okay, well, I am changing the order of the questions a little bit because I got some interest in this. 
Um, but the next question, um, I know you all teach in a lot of different methods, but um, do you usually teach online asynchronously or synchronously? Any experience with hybrid online teaching? And do you have any advice on one method or the other? Yes, that may have been my interest in answering this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one of the... <clears throat> One of the many reasons that I wanted to is because I have taught and continue to teach semester to semester in so many different modalities. And so um, I have some classes that are completely asynchronous, some, some that are completely synchronous on Zoom. And then I have what we in our department call blended, which is I'm in a video conference room on campus in Stone Building and 20 students are there or during the pandemic times 19, because that's all you could space out. And then 20 or more are beaming in on Zoom, and so we blend it. One of the things that I have learned in this position is that there are so many definitions of hybrid that I have a really hard time keeping up. People, def I mean, hybrid is how you define it. It's sort of like virus. Um, and so, um, because I have so many different ways of doing this, the one thing that I have learned that I would like to recommend to those of you who teach asynchronously, and I learned it um, basically during the pandemic when uh, my students were feeling more isolated than they had before. But I wish I'd been doing it all along because it has greatly benefited retention. And that is that I have synchronous meetings three, four a semester in the late evening, because like Pam and Wade and others said, uh, there are 306 students in the online degree completion program that I direct and they all work full time. And most of them are teachers assistants getting their degree to become teachers. So I need to be tuned into that. So they take a lot of evening courses, but that going on Zoom with me, being able to ask about an assignment guidance, being able to get more input on a particular concept in the course, you know, just having a real person with a voice and a face and, you know, whatever else comes with, with it has really, really helped. And it has helped the grades. It has helped the enthusiasm. It has helped part of what Pam referred to, which is, you know, to answer their question, why am I here? Okay, I'm here to learn this content in the snippets of time that I have. So that's one thing I recommend if you teach asynchronously, provide a time when your students can actually meet you, even if it's on Zoom. Um, and the other thing that I have started doing a lot of is, well, for one thing, I use Starfish, just so you know. So those, those little reach outs are there. But if I sense a student struggling, I go ahead and take a chance and ask them if they would please meet with me on a video chat. And so, you know, we can talk about it. I have had more students this semester than ever before. I thought that, you know, the peak of the pandemic and last fall was going to be the worst, but this is it. So I would like to recommend, and that'll probably come in another question too, that you stay tuned in and reach out. Now, some people have too many bajillion students to do that, but as you can, it's the personal touch, no matter the modality. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Wade, I think, or Heather, either one. <laughs> Okay, well, if you're wait. So here's what I want to say to the, to the faculty. You're looking to invest a lot of time making content for a modality. And I want to save you that time because your time is important. And smart design is multi-use design. And so when you design things, you want to design things that could be used for just your traditional class as an online supplement. Also could be for an online class and also could be for a hybrid class. Uh, I have done all three using the same sort of content that I've created. You've sort of, you, you've emphasized different things for different modalities. But to give you an example of a, of a hybrid option that, that I've employed that um, has worked really well for me and my students was, 
once I had a fully online class, I was able to go in and say, look, I want to have smaller meetings in person so that I can have my students do things. And so I took a, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class and I split it into thirds so that everybody was in the online shell. All, most of their work was online, but rather than come in with say 60 students three times a week, each student only came in one day a week. So I had only 20 at a time was able to work in smaller groups. Uh, those numbers aren't relevant. You might decide to have it more or less. Uh, you might split it only two ways, but think about again, breaking stuff. You have those class periods, you have this online content. What's the best way to make efficient use of your time and your students' time? Because having them come in to listen to you repeat the thing that you, they could have watched online is not a good use of their time or your energy. Thank you. Heather. Building on what both Catherine and Wade said, for me, regardless of what style I'm using, because it always boils down to, it's not my preference one way or the other, it's the program I've joined and what we've been told we're going to be doing. Um, asynchronous was at University of South Carolina, synchronous is what we do here at UNCG. Um, it's always about building community in my online courses. Schools of Library Science are incredibly well known for having online programs. That's pretty much the way it goes. There's very few that are face-to-face -face, and they're all master's programs. So it's all adults. Pretty much all of them are fully employed somewhere and almost all of our classes are at night pretty much across the US. That's just the way it works. And so it boils down to, you know, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, how am I best going to build that community with my program, as opposed to just having a glorified correspondence course from the 1970s? I mean, how am I going to, instead of just delivering some information, like Wade was talking about, you know, watch it, read some stuff, do some things, um, you know, making how, if it's going to be asynchronous, I'm going to build in, you know, ways and methods if I'm meeting with my students or discussions or, you know, what am I going to have to, to have that community so we're not so separated from each other, whether my students are in Germany, Saigon or down the street. Um, with synchronous, it's, I feel a little bit easier, but, you know, I've also been told by my students, it can be a synchronous program and we're still completely separated and no communities built. So it, it is up to us and our students to help build that community among ourselves by what we have in our courses. Um, but, you know, it can be done in all methods and ways of delivery. And I would like to kind of add on top of what everyone's been saying, because particularly with Heather, what Heather just said is, uh, you know, communication is important. You know, my experience has been working in the School of Business. I teach a, a leadership class here, but prior to teaching this leadership class in School of Business, I taught for another university completely online, um, completely online program that is, uh, and a graduate program. And some students wanted more inter wanted more interaction some want to be completely asynchronous and so kind of meeting the students where they are but one of the one of the things i found to be universally important when working with students is that they want feedback so even if your course is completely asynchronous you need to make sure you build in timely feedback for your students so think of like asynchronous synchronous that's all about just how you're communicating out your, your content in some ways. Think about community as, as, as Dr. Morfield Lang was saying, as well as how you're going to build in that feedback. And, to, and I also do the course evaluations for the business school and you know, faculty that get the highest rated course eval numbers are the ones where students are saying that the faculty member was present and timely in feedback. You can have a very well-designed course offer asynchronously, provide no feedback, and students will, at least in the School of Business, will break you over the coals. And I think not only is it important for the students, but it's important for you as a faculty member too, because just going in and look, you know, the sense of community, I mean, like building that and getting those connections with your students. Otherwise, you're really just going in and looking at stuff and grading or, if you've already created content and then you're not doing something while you're in that teaching moment, um, you know, it, it, it just isn't as enjoyable. So for me personally, I think the connections and the community building is, is equal, you know, is, is as important for the faculty as it is for the students. So just finding ways to connect is really key.
So since a lot of y'all talked about um, connection, I am in gonna, again, kind of change up the order of the questions we have prepared um, to one about um, engagement. So can you talk about techniques you all use in your online teaching to engage students um, going, y'all talked about feedback and other stuff. Does this change based on your students, such as undergraduate students or graduate students? Anita. I can take that one. Um, so uh, I do several things with engagement. Some of it's interaction and some of it's with the content. So uh, just a few things. Um, I give the students, and this doesn't really change a whole lot whether we're talking about um, graduate or undergraduate students, um, but I give different assignment types. Uh, and in those assignments, I ask them uh, questions that are going to generate strong opinions. Uh, so that helps, you know, whether that's a paper or discussion, anything else. Um, yeah. Another thing is, so I, my subject is ancient history. And even with that, I make sure to present the material in a way that shows students how it's still relevant to their lives. And I feel like if I can do that with ancient history, then anyone can do that. Um, and the students really connect with that and they appreciate that. Um, and then similar to that, I ask them to incorporate personal experiences into their responses. Again, no matter about the assignment type. Um, some of these, uh, the assignments allow students to choose their own topic and or the presentation method. And those are always popular. Um, sometimes I'm actually surprised how popular they are. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and another thing I'll say, and I think that when we talk about engagement, we don't necessarily talk about this aspect as much as maybe we should, um, is um, in addition to assignments and communication, things like that, I also try to make the written content as engaging as possible. Um, there's no textbook to buy, but still there's a decent amount you know, of reading to do. So um, before students can really be successful with discussions or assignments or anything else, they need to have done the work. So um, in my content, I incorporate images and videos and things like that, but I also um, will create decision trees, uh, slideshows, um, I talk about ancient cities, so I created virtual tours of each of the cities that I talked about. Uh, the students really like those, and it gets them to interact with the content as well as the assignments. Um, and in fact, at the end of the semester, um, for students who have done well, they have a choice of doing um, sort of a more traditional reflection paper or to um, do Kind of like a virtual tour of a city of their choice in you know smaller scale and uh i'll give them the choice and i would think they would do the reflection because it's frankly i would think easier because if they've done the reading then they're kind of you know just pulling from that versus if they do their own little virtual tour they've got to pick the place and do all of that research and they always pick to do their own little virtual tour so those things are, are really popular so i would just say with um, engagement it, it will vary from course to course, but especially in my case with a history course, um, it's kind of um, equal emphasis on assignments and communication, that kind of thing, as well as how I present the content. I see that question real quick. Um, uh, so just as a, a quick answer, um, you may be surprised by this, but I do all that in PowerPoint now. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying that, but uh, there was a point where I couldn't really do what I wanted to do in PowerPoint. So I would use things like um, Adobe Captivate, you know, more uh, complex programs, which was fine for me, but you know, that wasn't really, um, they weren't great tools for teaching, you know, a wider audience how to do this. But PowerPoint has come a long way. And, <laughs> and so I do all of those things with PowerPoint and making interactive buttons. Um, and then uh, you can, upload your PowerPoint into Office 365, and that will let you embed the PowerPoint into a Canvas page so that when the students go to um, the Canvas page, it's right there. They don't have to open anything separate. It's right there. The buttons are clickable and they can walk their way through. So it's actually very easy to do. It's just anything like that takes some planning out because you have to think of, um, you know, you have to map out where each click is going to take you. Um, but we'll um, we'll have sessions on this at ADAPT, so uh, you can hear more then.
Yeah, Catherine. <clears throat> um, she's more techy than I am, but I do have something that that um, that I do um, just on a social perspective, and that is that I use, um, and the name changes every academic year or every semester, but I call it Arc Studio. So somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there have been several iterations, but it's on Canvas and it's easy to use. And it depends now, and it needs to be said that I only teach undergraduates. Now I teach a lot of different methods, courses, practicum courses, introductory, you know, that kind of thing, but somebody else is gonna have to address the graduates. But I have in each of my courses, at least one, and in each course, it's very different assignment where they actually record on Arc Studio and talk to each other. And so in one of my courses, I have a book club and there are four different books that they choose based on content. And the book club members talk to each other, actually talk to each other on studio. And like in a higher level course, like, you know, right before they graduate and they're big in their classroom student setting, um, I'll do peer reviews where they observe each other's practice and with warnings about not being nasty, do peer reviews of these videos of each other. In some courses, all I, can, all I do is just have an introductory video where they tell about themselves and do all of this. And then people find the students to whom they relate and talk to them about this. So I find that the class the classes are more cohesive after they've had a chance to not be typing to each other or typing to me. I, that, that's refreshing. So I just want to suggest introducing, using the students, allowing the students to access the ability to video chat with each other um, in, in your courses in different, different ways that match what the course is. Yeah, Rob. Yes, and I would like to kind of add on to what uh, Catherine was saying and, and what Anita was saying. I think one of the common themes uh, when we're talking about engaging students is being able to present content in creative ways, as Anita mentioned, as well as putting that technology in the hands of students. So one of the things I have done in my course uh, similar to, to what Catherine was talking about, I will give students a project where I allow them to choose, and similar to what Anita does too, you can write a paper, you can do a narrated PowerPoint, you can do a video. It's like, I want you to express yourself how best you want to express yourself. And by giving students those particular opportunities to allow them to decide how they're going to do these kind of culminating projects, it, re it resonates more with students. At least that's what I've, I've found. So kind of continuing on, just to make sure we cover everything that y'all would want to say about topic of engaging students. Um, so what's your favorite UNCG instructional technology tool, like Catherine mentioned, um, Canvas Studio, formerly known as ARC, um, whether you're creating materials or engaging students. So some other examples beyond Studio would be Canvas itself, Panopto, Google, uh, Microsoft Office, et cetera. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's anything that anyone wants to add beyond Catherine talking about Canvas Studio. I actually use a lot of the Google tools. So whether that's using um, Google Documents or Google Slides and just setting those up so that students can share in the creation of whatever the um, assignment is, or they're having conversation. And sometimes when you're in either a Google Doc or a Google Slide, students can still have a, uh, what turns into a conversation through the commenting spaces and things like that. So it may not be live time unless, unless they happen to be on there at the same moment, but you oftentimes, even if you're doing like peer reviews or other things where it, it can be conversational, uh, they can just build on each other. So if Catherine had put something up and I make a comment that maybe Anita will step in and either agree or 
offer something else that takes it a little bit further. And I found that that's also been a helpful place to sometimes set up assignments where they can choose to put in a picture of themselves or something else that's representative so that you don't have to force them to put up a picture of themselves if that aren't, that's something they're not comfortable with. But uh, I often use that for introductory kind of activities because I just think that it's relatively easy. Most people can do it on their phones or other devices. So I have stuck with Google, even though I know there's lots of other great ways to, to do that as well, but it's been pretty simple. Wade. So taking up from Google, don't forget the value of something as simple as YouTube which is great for hosting videos, even if you make them so that only people with the link can see them. That's very useful. You can embed them right back in Canvas and then you know they're hosted well, they stream well, they work on all devices, all that compatibility stuff. But also because you can make your YouTube videos public. But video is the key because it, when people talk about engagement, just having videos of you wearing something interesting, standing somewhere, inter somewhere interesting, varying it a little bit, the students get a sense that you're a real person and they feel connected to you. The use of video is huge. And so much so that uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Jeff Kaplan being one of them, um, have their own YouTube channels that they've let their course videos be public. And Jeff Kaplan, of course, has 17,000 subscribers. I just looked. Um, and, and Adam Rosenfeld has almost as many on his as well. And it's just two guys doing philosophy talks. Jeff uses the Lightboard Studio, if you've ever seen that, where he can write on the screen. Uh, those things engage the public. They open up other opportunities and get students, even alumni, to stay engaged. Um, so. Great, great stuff. I highly recommend you use video. Thank you. And I just put in the chat um, the link to the what Wade was talking about of the light board, light board studio, I think I'm saying it right, and then the other options available for those kind of uh, video labs on campus. Um, and note above, I did put a link to your ITC um, in case people need that for their recording. Uh, definitely reach out to your ITC with any instructional technology questions, uh, online teaching, Canvas, all the stuff we're talking about today. Heather? Not the most exciting, but um, I use the discussion board a great deal because of everything that I have going on in my classes. So I teach a storytelling class and all of my students record all of their stories. And so that everyone can share their stories unless they're performing live in class, all of their videos are listed, um, un, not un, um, unlisted, pu not, uh, public to us, but not everyone as Wade was talking about. Um, so this way we can share all of our performances with each other and we have our discussions and I used to do blogging. And so the discussion board, while it looks like, you know, it, it uh, can be just, you know, a way that we can discuss back and forth, but it's also in many of my classes, how we actually peer share our assignments. And then in my technology class, uh, similar to Rob, um, I give a lot of choice as to what type of tools they can use to turn in a variety of assignments. So you might have a public service announcement or you might have an infographic assignment. You can use a wide variety of tools to create those things. But then in the discussion boards where we share the final product that we have created, and it's, the, it's an easy tool to use, but it's there for everyone to see, easy place to link, easy place to post. And so, I mean, you know, it's there. It's, it's, you know, one of the basic tools we have, but I mean, it's one of the easier ways to use, easier items to use within Canvas. So. Anita? I'd like to mention just a few things that kind of piggyback on what some other people have said. Uh, first, especially uh, Catherine talking about Studio. Uh, that's a really great tool. It does a lot of different things in addition to just you know, video, you can do uh, screen recordings. So if you want to give uh, your students an introductory tour of your course, you can do that. You can easily add captions and edit your captions to your videos. Uh, you can record live in studio or you can upload a video and then work on it. Um, and you can also um, embed quiz questions in your video, which I don't think some people necessarily realize, but that's an, a neat tool. Students can also um, upload their own uh, videos via studio in an assignment. So, uh, you know, second Catherine and studio is a great tool. Um, another just that I mentioned before is, is PowerPoint because I, I use that a lot, again, not for traditional presentations, but, you know, 
thinking kind of outside the box of how you can use PowerPoint is nice. But the, the other thing I would mention, and I have to say, I haven't actually used this myself yet. Um, but um, so in my course, there are a few readings that I think are a little more complex. And if this were a face-to-face -face course, I would be taking that reading and kind of going through it with the students to make sure they understand what's really being said and maybe the context around what's being said. And, you know, you can do that online, but it, it doesn't really translate that well into content. So what I did was I found um, an external tool that lets me um, annotate PDFs. So I can highlight the PDFs and then I can put comments to the side. I'm kind of like what you can do with a Google Doc, but it lets you easily do it with PDFs. Um, and so I'll kind of walk the students through the readings that way. And they, I mean, they really love that. Uh, I mean, I can see why, because I'm kind of you know, highlighting the important points, but in fairness, I'm doing this for more complex readings that they would get that in person anyway. But um, similar to that, uh, the Canvas assignment tool now has an option where you can um, uh, do um, an annotation for students. So you can give students a file that they annotate and send back to you in the assignment. So uh, it's, fairly new. I haven't used it myself, but I think that that is a tool really worth exploring because, um, you know, if you're questioning whether students are doing certain readings or if you have readings, again, that are more complex and you want to see what they're getting out of it, um, in addition to lots of other uses, uh, that's a neat tool to have. And so um, I'll definitely encourage looking into it. Great. I think Catherine, you're next. I just want to quickly add a couple of thoughts. One, I want to piggyback on what Pam said. Um, yet, you know, those Google Docs where they can all go in have a lot of merit with the way we use them in our major uh, in, in some I use in, in a particular class is so that um, the students can build a children's book library that is appropriate in their classrooms when they teach. So throughout the semester, they can post um, books that they recommend that are positive about um, different family compositions, children with disabilities uh, included in the classroom, different cultures, different races, um, uh, different gender choices, you know, stories about women that work construction and are firefighters and, you know, things like this, and they build that list and they can print it and then they can refer to it to be sure they're reading the books to children that help them grow up to celebrate differences. The other thing I wanted to add to my studio conversation is Panopto. I use that and that's one that um, Sam mentioned. And the way I use that is to um, give the students videos of uh, classrooms that they can observe over and over again. Um, because my students graduate to teach our youngest citizens and you might think, oh, all they're doing is playing da 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 da. But observing a bunch of children in early childhood and seeing where they are and what you need to do next and how to get them to the next level is a little harder than it meets the eye. But you know, on Panopto, you can put a video recorded in a classroom and they can watch it over and over and over again to really capture those observations and you know in a classroom it goes like this but on the video they can hone their skills so I want to just give a little shout out for those two thank you yeah Pam Yeah, so probably a couple other tools uh, one thing to think about just with the students if they're having to do a lot of reading uh, is also to consider whether that's like a read and write software or some other software to just help them to think that you don't necessarily have to read every paper. If you are taking a walk or you're doing something else, you could set that up to read to you. You know, you might not enjoy that voice perhaps, but <laughs> um, just to provide options because sometimes our students are just talking about just get tired of reading or I'm not able to sit and stare at the screen or whatever it may be. So sometimes that's another way to uh, you know, just encourage, just, just to help them to know that there's different options that way. And then also, um, you know, we mentioned some of the Google tools, uh, but also for website creation, 
you can use Google Sites, you could also use WordPress. So those are things that we've used for different assignments. And then the nice thing is students build those and then they hopefully can use them beyond the class itself. Um, and, and I know this is about engaging, but I also would say when you're asking students to do these things to also consider about some of the low stakes or building it in early. So if you think video production or voiceovers or whatever might be part of a later assignment, well, why not include a video in your opening, um, you know, introductory piece, even if that's in the discussion board, well, let's have a short video. And then if people can't do it or do it well, then they can be asking for help early on in the semester. Uh, you know, and even whenever you're doing these assignments, be okay with mistakes to try to build them again, those earlier or low stakes things, um, you know, and you'll have better products when they, when it's bigger and better things that they're doing later on. Rob? Yes, I would agree with everything that Pam ha has said and including what Wade has said about incorporating video. One of the products that I have used uh, in my courses is called uh, Padlet. And so if I could just do, if I could do a quick screen share because my students have allowed me to show at least um, this one semester I was teaching this particular class. Um, so here are the final products. The students were tasked, and this is actually, this is actually a mid-semester product. They have another uh, assignment that comes later in the class, but the students were um, picked a certain population and then talked about either mental health related to that particular population or you know other special considerations when working with that population. A lot of these students are were in a joint sports psychology program as well as a counseling mental health program. And so this was a way, and this was an asynchronous course, so this was a way for them to share their presentations with each other. And then we use the discussion for, forums to have additional um, conversations about uh, these topics. So again, Padlet is another tool that you may want to check out. Great. That was a lot of great tools. Anyone else? And I put in the chat, sometimes we use Jamboard. It's a Google product. Um, so that's one that um, I like as well. Um, so I have two questions left and we have 14 minutes. So um, I'll ask y'all. Um, so one is about like, basically, let me, um, so one is about, many of you are directors of online programs and work closely with advisors and online students. Do you have any advice with working with online students such as retention and student communication? And how do you advocate for, your on, for the online students in your departments? And then um, the other one is, what are some examples of events or things you attend for professional development to improve or share about your teaching online or in general? Um, both are kind of like, we're kind of heading more about like online learning overall versus like online teaching. So um, since we have 13 minutes left, um, y'all can choose one or the other. I put them both in chat. We have a, uh, a group of online directors and administrators that anyone who is interested is welcome to join. Uh, Wade and Adam Landreth and Pam, a bunch of us are there. Uh, there were four to begin with, four programs represented there, now 31, including Pam's new program that started afterwards. And um, I invite you to join, but we are essentially an advocacy group for our online students. That's that's who we are. We meet twice a semester. We have speakers. And once, once we have them at our meeting, we can advocate. And we have done um, a long list of things that I will not name because we have 13 minutes. Just, you know, email me. Come on board. We'd love to have you. Thank you. If you have a problem with, if you detect any problem for online students, you let any one of us know because this group started and our, I remember the great get when we had like an associate registrar come and talk to us. 
uh, well, now the provost comes in and talks to us and she brings vice provosts and stuff because they know how important online students are to the university's future. And they're really interested in hearing from us and we need help from you too. Like, what are you seeing on the ground? Um, let's get those problems up the chain to get fixed. Thank you. Heather. So I'm not a director, so I'm going to go for the uh, second question. The professional development that I seek the most these days, um, starting when I was at the University of South Carolina, I worked, um, that was the first time I really was introduced to the full weight of um, online instruction and accessibility. And that's where I first really started thinking about, okay, we're teaching online. Uh, how are we making it available to all? And because I've got, uh, I had so much of a background in technology uh, tools and how to use them in instruction, which was my background, I was continuously looking for, you know, ways to make that easier because the argument was like, you know, accessibility is hard and captioning videos is tough and doing this, you know, and, and so much of the accessibility components seem to be extra. Um, but so much uh, more technology now is available to make it easier and simple for us and small tricks and tips that we can do to make you know, all of our content accessible. And so the um, professional development that I'm continuously seeking, information I'm seeking, conferences I'm seeking, um, is that I'm looking for um, you know, what is out there to make our online courses available to all of our students. Um, to make our courses, you know, to find the best way to deliver accessible classes, content, materials, um, all of the tools that we use, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, they're great and they're awesome, but how can they also be accessible as well? Um, you know, so those are the things that I'm always seeking and interested in. Well, those are our last two questions um, from my list. So if there's any questions from the audience, um, you can put them in chat or unmute. Um, so as people might be thinking of it, remember I did drop links to your instructional technology consultant. Uh, definitely be sure to um, talk to them. And then this is from like, again, kind of I don't know if sponsor is the right word, but uh, this is from the Online Learning Faculty Senate Committee uh, as a pre-conference event for ADAPT 2022, which is May 9th and 10th, I think. Uh, let me know if it's wrong and I'll drop the link to the chat in a little bit, so be sure you check it out. Amy asked, has teaching online changed the way you teach in other modalities? Yes, it has. It made me a better teacher. The first time you put together an online course and you organize all of your, le your lectures and other things, you realize that isn't as funny as I thought it was. That doesn't go there. The order here is backwards. Uh, I repeat this too many times. You start to see that great presentation you felt you always did is really not as great as it was. And you start having better content, more refined, more organized, and you cut the things that aren't essential. Am I alone in that? I find that I'm way bigger in person, but I'm pretty over the top online too, just because who wants a boring online instructor? Um, when you are only seen from like the waist up, people forget you have knees. And so, you know, you try to take as much space as you can. Um, Cause I'm only in this, I know some people are in much bigger rooms than I am. They'll see more of you, but you know, but I, I, I feel that when you see me in person, like at a conference or something, there's, there's more, but I don't know. That's just me. I think the pandemic has made more of a difference than online teaching has because it's like people. Um, it's that kind of thing when I'm actually in, in like, you know, a room with other folks. But yeah, now, but I agree with Wade wholeheartedly that, you know, cutting out the nonsense, minimalism, is this necessary? cutting to what needs to happen. Um, you know, we don't need to wax on for, you know, things along those lines. Order, what makes sense, what doesn't. Yes, definitely. That I definitely agree with. Anita? 
So this is more in the realm of um, final comments <laughs> about teaching online, but I, I did want to say this, not so much for the people who are here, but for you know anyone that might you know watch this. Um, I've been working in you know online teaching, uh, developing online courses for a long time, and it's changed a lot. And I think um, one of the biggest I guess problems that I see is that um, it seems like there's kind of a general expectation that uh, you can take someone who's never done anything online before, who maybe doesn't even use technology very often, and put them in a workshop for maybe two hours, and they're going to become you know, a good online instructor. And that is so far from the case. <laughs> you know, uh, and I think the, the, one of the biggest takeaways I would like is that you know, to realize that to become an effective online instructor takes some time. Um, there's not just the technology learning canvas, um, how to get your material in there, what kind of assignments to use. Uh, but the world of online learning has gotten so much bigger now. You have to know things like universal design for learning, accessibility, like Heather said, uh, quality matters, uh, engagement is just increasingly important. Um, so, you know, the best advice that I could give is to not rush, to take your time as much as possible, uh, to start simple with what you know, and then add more as you learn more. Um, and, you know, hopefully with departments, uh, I know the departments get kind of put in a bad position sometimes where you have no choice but to make kind of a last minute hire that may or may not have much experience. Uh, but just to try to be more intentional about, um, your online courses, who's going to teach your online courses, how much time realistically it's going to take to be able to do that effectively. Um, so if I had just, you know, one takeaway for me, that would be what I would want people to take. Don't be afraid to break stuff. Con best practices of today are just the conventional wisdom that was recently published and presented at a conference. And it always changes. And, and nothing means that somebody else isn't doing something better that hasn't gotten out there yet. So once you're comfortable with the basics, start experimenting and then start sharing. Because it's really about faculty showing faculty what they're doing. And that's why many of us have been here a long time. And that's what we've done. And that's the best training and the best professional development you're getting. It's just what's going on down the hall from me that I don't know about. And don't be afraid to talk to people. You know, I mean, any of us, we're always, I mean, I'm just going to toss people out there. I hope you don't care. But, you know, I mean, I'll tell anyone on my hallway. I mean, I'm not the expert or anything else, but I'm always happy to talk about online learning, please. But, you know, if you see someone like, wait, you see somebody who's doing something amazing, go talk to them or talk to your ITCs or talk to folks at UNCG online. You know, I mean, people love to talk about this. You know, they... Uh, I'm guessing we enjoy our jobs. We'll happily talk about it. And if you need help, help, you ask for it. You, you're not alone in this. And, and instead of, I tell my students this a lot, instead of struggling through something for hours, ask, just ask. <laughs> we can help. I would just say, remember people first. You know, you're part of the people, faculty, the students. Uh, you can make things look really pretty, but if they don't, um, serve their purpose and they don't engage you. There's not the communication. You know, there's just a, an element of people. So it's easy sometimes when you're on the computer to forget that. So again, just remember that that's the main, main piece um, that you really want to think about as you're designing and instructing. Anything else? We have three minutes. We can also end early. Yeah, Heather mentions function over fashion any day. Well, as we're wrapping up, um, Rob also says, keep it moving. <laughs> so I'll take that advice and say, as we're wrapping up, I did drop some links in the chats. If you're watching these recordings, um, the links are to ADAPT 2022, which is in May. So be sure to check it out. A lot of virtual options. So even if you're not on campus, uh, be sure to take advantage of learning from your colleagues at UNCG about teaching in transformative times. Um, be sure to reach out to your ITC um, about anything related to instructional technology, course design, or more. Um, and thank you for being here today. Um, and uh, have a great week. It's Monday as we're recording this. So um, 
Let's do it. Yeah, Catherine. Week 14. Week 14. We're doing it, y'all. It's April. Um, I told my seven-year-old that today. <laughs> We're getting there. Um, okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Thanks for the panelists. Thanks for the audience members. Um, and uh, everyone have a great week. Enjoy the weather, hopefully, if you can. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.